for the middle driver utilising our FST or surroundless Kevlar technology. Well, I think if you look at the Nautilus on the side, you can see its a uh, key feature, which is the use of tapering tubes as absorbers. Um, it's quite a, a simple concept to understand, in, in principle at least, and it's um, the internal form uh, effectively dictating the external form. Um, what we're using is uh, we're using horns in reverse, so rather than amplifying the sound that's coming out the front of the loudspeaker, we're using the horns on the rear of the loudspeaker to um, get rid of the sound, that, that, that the unwanted sound that's coming from the rear of the diaphragm. It works really well, and we use it on all our tweeters now. The 800 series head looks quite different to the Nautilus system. Uh, again, we've got a driver mounted in its own enclosure, and it does appear to have a tube, but it's quite different because um, a tube only works for drivers which have a relatively small bandwidth that produce plane waves. Uh, the Nautilus is a four-way system with um, pistonic drivers, and it's a perfect application for those. But when we're trying to use something like an FST driver, which has got a relatively broad band in a three-way system, you get you tend to get colorations because um, the FST driver tends to emit a lot of its high-frequency energy from the neck of the cone, and these tend to get bounced forward and round inside the uh, inside the tube, and you tend to get a, a cuppy coloration, which effectively sounds like you've got your hands round your mouth. Um, so instead of doing that, we actually found that a, a spherical enclosure would be much better because the sound tends to get bounced away from the diaphragm rather than back, back out of the diaphragm. But the trouble is that using a, a spherical enclosure on its own uh, is that a, a sphere has actually got some quite serious problem, uh, problems with cavity resonances. And uh, you can damp those by using lots of wool, um, but unfortunately lots of damping tends to rob the speaker of its dynamics. Um, we tried diffusing this with um, things like lozenge-shaped speakers, but they had problems of their own. In a simplistic fashion, the ideal solution to solving the problems of the, of the sphere resonance and, the, and the, tube, the tube's problems would be just to join the two, so you'd have the, the spherical part directing the sound away from the, di the diaphragm and the tubular part absorbing the sound. But unfortunately, if you just blend the two together, it doesn't really work. And we actually found the solution which was, I guess it was inspired by exhaust pipes or uh, telecommunications or, or that sort of ilk, um, was the use of um, a matched impedance mismatch. And what, that's quite difficult to explain, but what it effectively means is that we've made a, a sharp discontinuity at the other end of the sphere, which, it, which matches the discontinuity uh, by the driver. And if, if we have the, the, the driver size and the, and the tube entry size the same, we effectively get, get this matched impedance mismatch. And it's as if um, the, the driver is firing directly into the Nautilus tube, but without all the inherent problems of the tube. But a number of these speakers uh, often have interesting shapes, and they're usually for a good reason. Um, I mean, if you look at our reflex ports, port, it's a case of aerodynamics dictating the overall form. Um, we've obviously got a nicely profiled port flare. Um, but if you look at it more closely, you can see that it's got very small dimples on the surface, and there's a good reason for that, and it's not just appeal to, to the gol golfers uh, amongst our customers. Um, it's, qu it's quite a simple concept to understand. It's effectively, if you know anything about airflow, you know that as velocity increases, the pressure decreases. So what we're do using the dimples for is to stir up the air uh, close to the surface of the, of the port flare, which uh, increases the, the local velocity and helps make the air stick to the surface of the, of the profile of the port flare. Um, it works really well actually, it helps give us a bit more headroom um, and if you're playing loud bass notes it, it delays the onset of chuffing you know, by about 6 dB. Um, we can't pretend to know a huge amount about, about aerodynamics, um, especially with loudspeakers because, um, or loudspeaker reflex ports because it's oscillating flow and that's very difficult to, uh, to model. And it's a bit like trying to make a, a racing car go as fast in reverse as it does go forwards. We don't like the shaft too much, but um, we're actually quite good in the racing car department as well. Um, over the last few years, we've been doing this thing called the Goodwood Gravity Challenge, which is a, a downhill race. Um, and we've designed and built this uh, this little car in our lunch times, and we've actually done quite well in it. We've uh, managed to come second a couple of times and beat a lot of the major motorsport names like Lotus, Bentley, Full, Jaguar, Pro Driver, people like that. And yeah, so we're quite, we're quite pleased with that. And it, I, I guess it goes to show that we're quite an in innovative bunch in, in standing. If we put our minds to something, we can do quite well. <laughs> Got a loudspeaker driver here. And basically, it works by having a diaphragm moves forward and backward to vibrate the air to make a sound pressure. And um, it radiates equal amount of energy forwards and backwards 
um, the problem is that um, when the wavelength becomes uh, comparable with the diaphragm itself, the sound from the back of the cone, the sound pressure on the back of the cone, will cancel out the pressure on the, in the front of the cone, and as a result, there'll be, be, be no no sound. Um, so, first of all, to actually create low frequencies, it's important to isolate to isolate the, the rear sound from the front sound, and the most simple way to do that is to put is a so-called infinite baffle, which is a wall that extends to the infinite. An open baffle uh, design to work down to, for instance, 40 hertz, the baffle would need to be about eight meters across, which is still not very practical in, in, in domestic environments. So the way to, to come around this problem is um, to simply to mount the driver in a box. When a drive unit is mounted in a, in a cabinet, effectively, the sound radiated forward and backward is isolated from each other. So low frequencies can be reproduced. The problem is, because the drive unit is radiating as much energy backwards as forward, all the energy that is trapped within the cabinet can actually make the walls vibrate. And um, the surface area of cabinet walls can be up to 30 times larger than the area of the radiating drive unit. And as a drive unit or a loudspeaker is effectively a, a vibrating surface, even the smallest vibration of the cabinet walls actually add substan can add substantial to the to the output of the drive unit, and this uh, this additional um, sound radiation is what we call coloration, because it's not wanted. What you want to hear is the sound from the drive unit and the sound from the drive unit only. BMW's approach to create the ideal cabinet is that uh, as an addition to the relative high damping and high mass of conventional cabinet, we have added the so-called matrix structure, which is a set of interlocking panels um, in a sort of uh, lat lattice stock structure, um, a so-called multiple bracing system. This adds an incredible amount of stiffness, but not just that. Because of the matrix structure, the glue joints also add additional damping. So by this, you, you get a really rigid and you almost get the ideal cabinet, which satisfy all the requirements for good cabinet, high stiffness, high damping, and high mass. And as a result, the vibration level, or the, i.e. the sound output from the cabinet, is minimal. Curves are used everywhere where you need something strong. Look at a bridge, an arch and a bridge, for instance. And another thing is uh, by having curved cabinets, the numbers of glue joints, which are weak points in conventional cabinets, are kept down at a minimum. Also, by having a curved cabinet, um, the so-called standing waves within the cabinet, which are, which are acoustic resonances, um, are kept at a minimum. John Bowers once said that uh, we're not trying to give the most in a loudspeaker, we're trying to lose the least. And this is very relevant, although that was many years ago. This is the key to loudspeakers. It's, it's not losing the, de the fine detail in the loudspeaker. Well, um, this desire to minimize the crossover components can really only come about due to the fact that uh, we've advanced our measurement te techniques to give us a much greater insight into the mechanisms which actually cause the distortion and coloration in drive units. These are the things which, which will mask the performance so that you can't tell whether something is live or recorded. So our aim is to create an illusion of reality uh, by giving the listener accurate auditory clues and the coloration and distortion will seek to mask this information. Uh, now. Uh, advances in drive unit design have virtually eliminated many of these phenomena. Uh, but unfortunately at the same time they've highlighted the differences in the sound of components within the crossover, which is why this listening process is so important. You can get two identical, identically looking components, they spe specify the same way on paper, but um, from different manufacturers, but actually they will have a very, very different sonic characteristic. And the the only way that it's possible 
to to weed out the ones which are, are sound good is by listening to them one at a time over and over again and, and, and determining which ones have the best sonic character. So it takes the complexity up an order of magnitude.